The, the situation is this. There, there's a man called Frank Charlton who is a school teacher in Maidstone, Kent. And um, his hobby, he's become very obsessed with the authorship question. And he sold his car and made a little uh, studio in his garage with a webcam. And on certain evenings of the week, he goes to this garage and, and um, goes live onto the internet uh, uh, to try and change people's mind about the authorship question. He was at one time a very um, uh, high-flying <laughs> scholar and was going to become um, uh, a kind of Stephen Greenblatt or someone like that, but he, his PhD paper was rejected, and you hear, hear why, um, and, and he's come down to this place. On this particular evening is a big thunderstorm, and it's early days of the internet, and uh, the premise of the play is that the, um, the mixture of the internet and the bad weather, that for the first time, uh, William Shakespeare reincarnates <laughs> and, 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 uh, and arrives at his garage. Later in the play, Francis Bacon, the Earl of Oxford, Mary Sidney also reincarnate, um, and the situation gets very complicated. But all we're going to look at is the arrival of William Shakespeare in Frank Charlton's garage on this particular evening. Um, now, Frank Charlton has a friend who lives, lives next door called Barry Wilde. And about 25 years earlier, Barry Wilde wrote a pop song called I'm a Sputnik Love God. <laughs> As you would. And, 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 that, um, and that was a, a top of the pops hit. It was a, he was a one hit man. Uh, and ever since, he's never had a hit song. But he, he had a certain amount of money, and he has helped Frank with the studio. He's helped with the webcam, and the, he's the um, musical director, artistic director of Frank's um, show. Anyway, Frank is very wound up on this particular evening, um, and he has been doing his, the opening of his show, Who's There, it's called, and he's been listing all the reasons why you shouldn't uh, believe in the man from Stratford. And um, Barry has come through and seen that he's, ha he's having a rough night, and there's a telephone. Uh, there was a live telephone on the set, and at any moment in the play, the audience could call us during the play. In fact, at the beginning of the play, we said, please don't turn your phones off, but ring the actors at any moment you want to during the play. And people did sometimes, and then we would have to improvise the answers. Um, <laughs> Nice to see Sam Parks is here. Sam, who played the policeman in the play, is here today. So at, at this particular moment, Barry has gone back to his house next door to fix the drains. He's got problems with his drains. And, uh, um, but he's concerned about Frank. And Frank has finished um, his, his thing. Uh, and we're going to read a little bit of this for you. So I'll play Frank. Peter's going to play Barry. Barry and... Uh, Annabelle, oh, that's right, you're going to do the... Um, going to do the narration. That's right, and Robert is going to play Our Man. <laughs> the question is, how, how, how did that small town actor acquire all this knowledge and life experience? What does Frank say? You can be born with genius, folks, but you can't be born with book learning or life experience. He picks up a first folio with a picture of Shakespeare on the front. Mr. Shakespeare and speaks to it. Mr. Shakespeare, at present, your life story and the book learning and life experience in these plays don't match. The phone on Frank's desk starts ringing. Frank looks at it with surprise. It has never rung before, ever, in all the broadcasts he's done. <laughs> Fantastic, he says. The phones are ringing. Stay with us, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take some calls and move this historic debate forward. Hello. This, this is Frank Charlton, your host on Who's There? Uh, what's your question? Hello, this is Derek Jacobi. Tim Derek Derek Jacobi? Yes, Derek Jacobi. Oh my God. Oh. Oh my God, this is the first call, Derek. I mean, I mean Sir Jacoby. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm just, I left a message last year, but I never thought you would call back. May, may I ask, do, do you mean Sir Derek Jacoby, the actor, or another man with the same name? Yes. The actor, it's me, actor Sir Derek Jacoby. I, I'm, I, I didn't know you were Scottish. Yes. Scottish. 
just putting on my porridge. Oh, I'll have some salt in my porridge. There we go. Now, I just wanted to say how much I enjoy your show. Barry? <laughs> Barry! For God's sake, Barry, you have no idea the day I've had today. I've got a meeting in the morning with the headmaster and loads of parents accused of upsetting the boys' fragile sense of identity by questioning the identity of Shakespeare in class. How did you know it was me? Derek Jacobi's not Scottish. <laughs> the only accent I can do, I, th I thought it might help. Well, it didn't help. It didn't help. And he hangs up the phone. He hangs up, looks at the camera. Frank takes down a framed letter from the back wall of the set and approaches the camera downstage on its tripod. His face and the letter appear as large as possible on the screen above. You see this, ladies and gentlemen, do you know what it is? This is the letter rejecting my PhD by one of our top universities. And do you want to know why my PhD was rejected? Here's the title. The identity of the author of the Shakespeare works, a question of reasonable doubt. That's right. The one question you can't ask at university. The one question you are not allowed to ask on the International Shakespeare website, Wikipedia. I mean, it's like telling Galileo that he can look at the heavens through his telescope, but only if he looks at the moon. <laughs> as long as an open inquiry into the cause of these works is suppressed, how can we really understand their incredible beauty in humanity? As long as this unbelievable situation exists, this rejection letter stays framed on my wall and I stay here, still searching for the true identity of William Shakespeare. Scene three, the first guest ever, William Shakespeare. <laughs> Two knocks on the door. Who's there? Frank. Who is it? William Shakespeare enters. Hello, Frank. <laughs> Who are you? Who do you think I am? Who do you think you are? No, who do you think I am? <laughs> and more to the point, why do you think I am anyone other than who I actually am? <laughs> what? Why do you do it, Frank? What? <laughs> why do I do what? Why do you get yourself into such a twist about who I am? Haven't you got better things to do? You don't need this to make you special. You should be proud of being just an ordinary good old teacher like your father, Tom. How, how do you know I'm a teacher? How do you know my father's name? Uh, so what's all this about books? Books. Books. <laughs> do you know there are more books about my play Hamlet than there are about the Bible? But then I had a head start. There wasn't an English Bible until a few years after Hamlet. Have, have you been sent here by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust? No. The Shakespeare Institute? No. The, no. Is this some sort of joke? You can't fathom me, can you? Do you really think people have to be extraordinary themselves to do extraordinary things? I lived a thousand extraordinary lives in my writing. So many kings and lovers and murderers. They tired me out, Frank. But that's not who I am. You dress up as William Shakespeare, break into my studio, hijack my show, and then... Oh, it's time you stopped, Frank. Please let it go. I don't want to be a man of the millennium. I just want a good millennium sleep. Every... Every time you challenge me, some fool starts another penetrating biography. Closer, <laughs> closer to Shakespeare, Shakespeare the player, Shakespeare the lost years, Shakespeare for all time. Each one's like an electric shock in my sleep, waking me up again. I mean, if I had known the, what it's like to be a ghost, I never would have given them such small parts. We see <laughs> Of the garage. You think you can come in here, pretending to be William Shakespeare, sabotage my show? Barry rushes in. Scene four, the interruption of the neighbor's musical genius. Shakespeare looks at the books. Barry enters, making sure he doesn't forget a song he's just composed in his head. Got a song, Frank. After I rang you, I went out with a guttering, and bam, I've got it. After 22 years, my follow-up, Long Green Summer Grass. It's got it all. Love in the afternoon, the great flood, it's like a green... Love anthem. It's sort of Al Gore meets Barry White. <laughs> Hello, Barry. What are you doing? 
What are you doing? Who's that? Yes, who's that? Why? Why what? What? Why? Why do you do something like this without telling me? Hiring a look-alike. I don't think that's very professional, you know, to keep secrets from your musical director. I thought we were working together on this. Oh, fuck it, fuck it! I forgot the fucking song! I forgot the fucking tune! Look what you've done! I can't remember it, it's gone! Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Don't say maybe. When you're way down, let me lay down. That's my song. Lay down with you in the summer grass, in the long green summer grass. That's the song I just made up. I'm changing my drains down. So baby, when it rains down, ain't no summer hose gonna turn, gonna burn my long green summer grass to brown. I thought the repeats helped the rhythm. Who is this guy? Frank? <laughs> Why, why, why don't you both just stop pretending, stop pretending, get out, go on, get out, both of you. I've never met the man before in my life, I swear. I'm Brian May's plectrum. <laughs> Scene five, the first interview ever with William Shakespeare. Right. May I just finish this before I go? Do you know any more of my songs? Yes, but what I like best is that children's book you're working on. You never told me you were working on a children's book. Right? I never told anyone about Teddy and the Philosopher's Guitar. <laughs> What, what, what are you, like a professional mind reader? Is, is that your act? Yes, in a way. I suppose I always was, but since I died... Listen, listen, just listen to me. You Shakespeare kissagram. <laughs> you look alike fake. You bald-headed, bladder-faced Midlands prey. Hey, Frank, why don't you give him a chance to explain himself? Because his mind is closed, Barry. He doesn't want to know who wrote the plays. He wants to know he's right. And I think he's probably got some kind of a hang-up about common people creating great works of art. Now, Shakespeare gets up to go. Now you're talking. No, I haven't. Well, I'm off now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say thank you to everyone, actors and audiences everywhere, for making my plays the big successes they are. I never imagined they would last so long. Yes. <laughs> you, you never imagined they would last so long because he never imagined them in the first place. Right. <laughs> you know, I think I might go up to Stratford upon Avon and, and visit the Birthplace Trust. What's the best way to get there? How did you get here? How did you get here? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Something to do with the internet and the weather. Look, I've, I've written something for you, Frank, just to show you that there are no hard feelings. One of your favorite sonnets. You wouldn't believe the money you can get for any old document connected to me nowadays. <laughs> Shakespeare puts it on the desk. Oh, very, very impressive. Very impressive. Phony Elizabethan writing. You've been up all night rehearsing this. Well, don't you want a handwritten sonnet? No, I don't want your lousy work. Hands it up and throws it in his face. Yes. Well, I'll make my own way. Fare thee well, Barry. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, By the way, I just wanted to say, I don't know if your friends have told you, but you've, you've got severe hygiene issues. <laughs> well, I'll make my own way. Fare thee well, Barry. Fare thee well, Will. You know, I'm retired. I just want to be left alone, like Prospero. Let your indulgence set me free. If Shakespeare's so like Prospero, why didn't he educate his daughters? Well, they didn't want to be educated. Why didn't he write or receive any letters? I conducted my business in person. Why did Shakespeare never write about his hometown, oh, Stratford? Which would you rather go see and hear? The tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, or the slightly embarrassing day in the life of John, glovemaker of Stratford? <laughs> People in Stratford had no idea he was a playwright. I kept myself to myself. Then why was he so litigious? What's any of this got to do with my work? That's exactly my question. Well, you know you can see inside my head. Can you see inside Frank's? When? In the past, present, or future? Once you die, your existence is not bound by time or space. What was Frank doing last Tuesday at, say, 11.37 in the morning? Well, he was in the classroom teaching my play, Romeo and Juliet, and he was just about to confiscate a mobile telephone from a young student named James who was texting a friend behind his desk. And what did the text say? It doesn't matter. Toss a Charleston is a dickhead. <laughs> in the first folio... Collection of my plays. 
Ben Johnson refers to the author as the sweet swan of Avon in Stratford-upon-Avon. And my fellow actors, Hemmings and Condale, also refer to me as the author. How do you explain all that? Why? Why? If I wasn't the author, why? Until you can answer that, you haven't got an answer. Well, you haven't even got a question. Shakespeare goes out into the evening. I think, I think, I think we'll have to stop there. Oh. <laughs>